after I drank the brew, after I drank down about two ounces of thick, nasty, bitter, somewhat oily ayahuasca, and I sat back down on my mat next to the shaman, he leaned over to me and he said the most remarkable thing. He said, if it isn't strong enough, you can have more later. <laughs> An hour later, when I was lying on my back, sobbing with laughter, my eyes like faucets, with tears just pouring down my face as though somebody had hit me with a watering can, I was trying to imagine, just trying to fathom how anybody could think this wasn't strong enough. <laughs> you know, it's a remarkable thing about tears. I don't know if you know about tears. We don't think about them too much. Like, nobody wakes up and says, God, you know, I just got to spend the day contemplating tears today. But tears are rich with stress hormones. And when we get into this amazing state with ayahuasca, at least what happens to me, you know, you purge out of every convenient and inconvenient orifice with ayahuasca. <laughs> some people throw up, some people get diarrhea, the really special ones, myself included, get both. And um, sometimes odd things come out of your nose, um, never with legs, thankfully, but, uh, or at least not actually. But the tears, what happens when you are having tears flow out of your body by the half pint. You're literally detoxifying instantly. See, this is medicine. Uh, one of the best ways to describe this medicine to you is, is to sort of reproduce something that Cesar, a uh, curandero outside of Pucallpa, did with me and a friend a couple of months ago. Now, this guy was wild. He was not a shaman. He was a curandero. His uh, father's a shaman. But we drank ayahuasca in his little office, oddly enough, about eight feet away from a church. And right about when we drank, people were singing hymns. And I don't object to that, but they were doing so very badly. And they were also doing it to a really crummy little organ, the kind that you'd give to like a 10-year-old to practice on. So the whole, I'm thinking, oh my God, I don't want to get off on ayahuasca and listen to honored Christian soldiers. So, but this fortunately ended and they packed up and turned off the lights and went home. And this guy, once we started to get off, did this most amazing thing. He crouched. First of all, he's, he drank ayahuasca too. But he crouched and he did this chant. And he liked to sweep his arms around like this. You say, no, he did this in Spanish, but I'm going to do this in English for you. No, 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 no. There is no doctor. No, no. There is no herb. No. There is no treatment. No, no, no. There is no course of action. No, 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 no. There is no therapy. There is no doctor. There is no surgeon. There is no specialist. There is nothing. No, no, no that compares with the one, the only La Medicina, Ayahuasca. And he did this for three hours. <laughs> and I'm thinking, after about two hours, sing anything else. <laughs> sing Abba, but don't do that again. Okay, man? Just like, give us some space. But in any case, back to sitting beside the shaman on the mat. See, I'd gone to him because I was dealing with grief that I couldn't get rid of. There's been this theme of grief here because grief is one of the things that afflicts us and hurts us in our hearts and takes away our energy and demoralizes us and makes it difficult for us to go through the days. I've had a lot of death in my life. I've had somebody die in my hands. I've like been around it. I'm, I'm the go-to guy. When somebody's dying, it's like they want me around because I'm all about taking care of things. When my mother died, I really fell apart. And after about 14 months of grief, I just plain was at my wit's end, and I went down to Peru, and I went to the shaman, and I said, look, I want two things. I want to get rid of this grief, and I want my energy back. And he said, how long do you have for you? And I said, three nights. And he said, 
oh, we can do that. <laughs> no. <laughs> now, I love this, you know. So this is the first night after he says, if it isn't strong enough, you can have more. Like anybody would do that. And so the first night after about, I don't know, an hour and a half or so, all of a sudden I'm sitting with my mother. And the thing that was cool about it was it was so ordinary. She didn't have light coming out of her head. There were no angels. There were no like, clouds going by. She didn't have psychedelic crocodiles crawling around. Nothing. We're sitting on the porch talking. And she said the most amazing thing to me. She said, you know, it's pretty weird that you had to come all the way down here and drink this stuff and throw up in a bucket to get rid of your grief for me. And I said, yeah, I know, but that's just the way it is. And she says, well, you've always been a little bit different. And you know, it's one of the many things I love about you. And it was this very pleasant, absolutely typical conversation with my mother. And when it was over, the grief was gone. And it never, ever came back. That's medicine. That is healing. The people who administer los hongos magicos, the magic mushrooms, in southern Mexico call them la medicina, the medicine. The roadmen and women who administer peyote in ceremony, the buttons, the mash, and the tea, what do they call it? The medicine. Ayahuasca is known as la medicina, the medicine. Because this is about and for healing. This isn't, hey, let's drink ayahuasca and go to the fish concert. No, 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 no. There is no fish concert. So the second night, now I've gotten rid of the grief, tick off one agenda item on my clipboard, my psychic emotional clipboard, but I need my energy back. So the second night, all hell breaks loose. After about 45 minutes, I'm not seeing people in this maloca in Peru, in the forest anymore. I'm just seeing this wild energetic grid in the shape of bodies. And at one point, I'm so, oh, well, there is the throwing up part. And those of you who've done ayahuasca know that this is something that's, not everybody does throw up, but when you do, it's this most epic thing. Nobody just kind of quietly goes, oh. that doesn't happen. <laughs> and when you've got 10, 15 things, I rush very well. When you have 10, 15, it's like, you know when you're a kid in elementary school and one kid pukes on the floor and every and the next, the next thing you know, the janitor is like the, the sawdust, and they're cleaning up the bar from like 20 coats because you smell it in the end. But that's what happens in the maloca. So it's this sort of symphonic barfing for a while. So we all do the symphonic barfing. And then I'm on my back. And because I can't sit up anymore, I'm just flattened by this stuff. And this gigantic anaconda, huge around. He visits me every time now. Huge around, completely psychedelic colors, gold, purple, orange, yellow, red, pulsing all around its scales, and it's slithering inside itself. Huge head, great big yellow eyes, taunts me. Says, So. Do you think he could sit up? It says to me in this really provocative, kind of weird voice. And I say, no, no, there's just no way he could sit up. And the idea, it's so staggering to me. It's like, do you think he could walk Everest backwards in pajamas and bare feet in the dark? Like, no, man. And so then the snake kind of and he slithers around some more, and then he says, So, do you think you could stand up? And I said, oh God, you know, the idea of standing up, it's like, 
do you think you could fly over the Washington Monument unaided? No. And so I'm just sobbing with laughter. All of this is too funny. And then, it, and then the best part, and this is one of the lessons we learn with ayahuasca, it says to me, so, do you think you're in charge? Well, that part just blows my mind. I can't even stand it. It's like I've watched 75 Three Stooges movies at that point, and I'm just hysterical with laughter. And the snake coils around right above me, pulsing its light the way a strobe light goes off and says, here we go, and starts pulverizing my chest with energy so hard that the sensation is though somebody is raining hammer fist blows on my ribs. And I really do think I might wind up with cracked ribs at the end of this night. And what happened in that moment was I realized there was only one way through. Resistance was futile. I was not in control. The one thing I don't like to do, because I am Mr. Take Charge, Mr. Go-To Guy, Mr. I Can Get It Done, is surrender. Give it up. Let go. Let somebody else do the driving. And I just go, okay, I'm probably going to wind up with 12 cracked ribs. I can't do anything about this. This is just, I just have to let go. And so for about two and a half hours, this snake alternately taunted me. How are you feeling now? <laughs> like, whoa, like half dead. How do you think I'm feeling? You know? <laughs> oh, and then at one point, the shaman calls me up to him, okay, to sit in front of him. And I look like, are you insane? And I kind of feebly call it, es posible? It's possible. And I get up and sort of crawl onto his mat. And of course, I'm not seeing him. It's just all this ferocious fire and light. And then I feel in the back of me that my entire spine is opened up and it's just blowing apart with fire. And I think, this is a really, really strange night. And so, and the shaman sings these beautiful, sweet, loving ikaros, the healing songs. And there's a neurotechnology to it if you pay attention because they sing a little bit on your left side for a while, and then they sing a little bit on you, then they come up, and they go down. And all of this chaotic energy, and all of this wildness, and this frenetic sense of self starts to balance out. Oh, it doesn't mean it gets any lighter than that, because once I was done from his map, and I returned to mine, the snake is like, hey, welcome back. <laughs> You're ready for more? And it starts pulverizing my chest all over again with this energy. And I'll tell you, when I got up the next day, I was Mr. zippity doo -dah. I was, yeah, man, I've done ayahuasca. I have gone to the mountain. I have climbed it, and I am here to talk about it. I had my energy back. That is amazing. That is amazing healing. Now you can go to ayahuasca because you're curious and you won't be turned away. And you can go to ayahuasca for any number of reasons. But the best reason to go is for healing because we all have things to heal. From that time, I've gone back to the ayahuasca many, many, many times with different people, with different shamans, with different curanderos. One time I remember uh, a guy said to me early, when I first was having my first experiences, he said, ask it for something, every time. So one night, I sat before drinking and I said, show me my best source of, show me my best source of personal protection. I travel all over the world, I'm in sketchy places, I, you know, constantly in different countries and indigenous native places, and you know, sometimes I have to be like, sort of, observant of what's happening around me. And, and so I'm thinking, I wonder what the ayahuasca is going to show me. And in the middle of the ceremony, it says, your greatest source of personal protection is the extent to which you remember to be kind. And it blew my mind. And I started going through all of the events in my life. 
in which I had like diffused situations by being positive and kind. And I went, oh my God, it's not carrying myself with confidence, it's not walking with purpose, it's not being alert, it's being kind. What an amazing thing to learn. A Hawaiian kuna that I had the opportunity to listen to said an amazing thing one time, and I've never forgotten it. He said, true healing brings into order the body, the mind, and the spirit with the past, the present, and the future. And I thought, what an exquisitely complete way to describe real healing. When you drink ayahuasca, and those of you who have done so know this happens, it gets so deep inside you. It goes so far. It goes to the places where light never shines. It goes deep into those. And when you have an understanding, it's not just this cerebration, this I get it. It's this all-consuming, completely whole, absolutely connected to all things sense of understanding of whatever issue it is. Now, we're in an odd time with ayahuasca. Those of you who've been around a while know this is like 1972 all over again. Only instead of acid and gurus and people running off to Rishikesh to get initiated and to get their malas, now it's the shaman game. Now it's go down to Peru or go to a ceremony here, sit with a shaman, do ayahuasca, this is an amazing thing, but I do also want to say, don't get too enthralled. These people are not perfect. The more the shamans get treated as knowing it all, which they don't, being perfect, which they're not, and being our sole advisors, which they should never be, the more of an ego trip they'll be on, and the more chaotic this will all get. We all, as we go through the process of working with this stuff that is clearly calling out to us, if we can, in the midst of the psychedelic chaos and the thrill of being in this amazing experience, also keep a tempered part of us that is realistic about what we can expect from these people, we can really carry this shamanic thing forward beautifully. But if we elevate these people to be more than they are, this is going to go very badly. We're in a time in which we need something, I believe, we need something radical, profound, dramatic, and just because most people can't tuck themselves away in a monastery for 20 years and meditate, kind of immediate. And ayahuasca is that thing. If you've done other psychoactive drugs, you know that Cesar was right. There is nothing that compares with ayahuasca. It is something extraordinary. It is something that does heal. Every person who's been up here has talked about the healing experiences they've had. If you go back, and this is the crazy thing about going back to it, everybody who does ayahuasca has scary experiences. I've had scary experiences and found myself the next night reaching for the glass because there's something that brings you back. So what I would say to you about this thing is that we are being called. You know, I, I uh, work a lot with medicinal plants and I sometimes meet very straight academic people and people who run botanical gardens. I always ask them the same question. I always say, are you working for the plant or is the plant working for you? And every single one of them with no exceptions ever throughout my entire career has stopped and said, no, I'm definitely working for the plants. There is a communication happening here. There is something going on. The depth of the roots of this brew and the shamanic tradition, these things, it's like they're rising up like sprouts out of the ground and tempting us with their beautiful green fertility and saying, come play. And those people who go to it, who drink the brew, who are sincere, 
who participate correctly, who are fortunate enough to be with the right people, have these marvelous healing experiences, come back and tell others, and it grows from there. I believe that we do have in ayahuasca the fabled pot at the end of the rainbow. And if we treat it well, it will treat us very, very beautifully indeed. Thank you.